Thank you, Blair, for being with us today. Oh, you're welcome. Let us, let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you that through the gift of modern technology, we can have this conversation today and to learn more about the work that we share in Malawi. We thank you for the opportunity to uh, work in the kingdom. And we pray that uh, we may learn more of how we can help and how we can encounter others and thus encounter you in our relationships with them. We thank you for this time. But most of all, we thank you for your love for us in Jesus Christ and pray that we may share that love with others. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now, Blair, when I was at Presbyterian College many years ago, mm -hmm. um, my first encounter with Malawi was through a student who was present there, David mm -hmm. Mafante. I don't know. Now, well, I don't think David's in the ministry anymore. I think the last time I read his name, he was involved in uh, the government. Okay. So I, I don't know. But he told us a lot about Malawi. And for me, I had not heard much about uh, what was happening in Malawi. Uh, but what impressed me was the way he used to talk about the faithfulness of the people. Hmm. You know, how, how to us they didn't have much, but they were happy and joyful and seeking to to uh, share with one another their faith. Uh, mm -hmm. He made quite an impression on a lot of us at PC at that time, and that was back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. so, but that was my first encounter, but he taught me a lot about Malawi and made mm -hmm. it more alive for me and for the other students who were there at that time. Right. So yeah, well. I know it's a large country, uh, I mean, it's, is it the... It's, it's, it's quite populous. It's not actually physically all that large, but it's, uh, there's, there's about 19 million people. Um, certainly the area of the country is, is smaller than, I think you should be thinking like New Brunswick and, and yeah. Nova Scotia, not uh, Quebec or Ontario, for sure. That it's not, uh, um, yeah, certainly not as big as, as any, any province um, west of, of New Brunswick. It's not, not anywhere near as big as that. Um, so I, yeah, I could talk just a moment about a little bit of, about Malawi's history to kind of give a little bit of context and then it, would that be helpful? Do you mm. think? Yeah, that'd, uh, be, that'd be nice to hear. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, as with most things, uh, Malawi exists as a country and it's somewhat arbitrary that it exists as a country. Um, the boundaries of language, for instance, aren't drawn in the way that the, the political boundaries are. But uh, in colonial times, so the late 19th century, late 1800s, um, Britain controlled what was then known as Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, and Northern Rhodesia, which is now Zambia, and Nyasaland, which is um, now Malawi. And in between those three, like a U, it's like two interconnecting U's like that, mm -hmm. where uh, Zimbabwe is my thumb and Zambia is the top of my hand and, and Malawi is my finger. And the other U is Mozambique, which was controlled by the Portuguese. And the, um, the British government really wanted to make sure that, that the Southern countries um, so Southern Africa, but also the, the Portuguese in, in Mozambique didn't push further north. That's what they were. So they were trying to hold the line with these three countries. Um, and we could spend a lot of time talking about, you know, how, how Zimbabwe and Zambia devolved, but uh, Malawi's story is a little bit more uh, prosaic in lots of ways. It was settled. Uh, it's, it's, its colonial presence was mostly Scottish. Um, so the, so, yeah, David Livingston. So there's a whole area called Livingstonia. Um, and there's a whole area called Blantyre, which is one of the, it's like the, the commercial capital, be like Toronto, um, the commercial capital, but it's named after where David Livingstone was born in, in Scotland. Um, so there's these vestiges of Scottish, um, Scottish missionaries in the south and in the north, and David Livingston's daughter married a, a South African minister. And so the middle part was um, 
was mission presence was a sort of Dutch reform uh, from the South African um, perspective. So uh, it went along like that and was relatively peaceful, although uh, Malawi has the distinction of having the first armed uprising against co colonial powers led by a minister, uh, which was in 1915 by a, a fellow named John Chalimbwe. He's on all of the money and he's a national hero. And he led an uprising against actually a distant relative of, of Livingstone, Livingston's, who by all, by all accounts was a piece of work. And so fully, um, fully justified in, in, in being the target of an uprising. And so there's some sense in which, like from the very start, politics and religion specifically Christianity have been very, very connected in Malawi and very tied up in their, their history. Um, John Talimbae was educated by, by Presbyterian missionaries, but then went to be, become a Baptist. He came to the United States briefly and uh, read Booker T. Washington, Frederick Douglass, other sort of black abolitionists, and then went back to Malawi and and started this larger uprising, which ultimately failed, but um, in some sense, but it did start to bring about significant reforms. And eventually, along with most of Africa, the, the colonizing powers were, were dismissed or overthrown. And in Malawi's case, there was a relatively peaceful transfer of power um, in the early 60s. Um, Kamuza Banda was the president and uh, like many things started out quite well and maybe didn't end as well as he started. Um, he um, was a Presbyterian and the Presbyterian church held great uh, power. About 40% about of the population are likely Presbyterian. It's hard to tell. Um, it could be a little bit higher. It's not much lower. Um, so we're talking about, you know, somewhere between four and five million people. To give you an idea, I think that the General Assembly last year reported that there were about uh, just over 100,000 Presbyterians in Canada. So the magnitude of Presbyterianism is so much bigger in, in Malawi than it is even in a country like Canada. Um, so eventually uh, there were abuses of, of free speech um, and abuses of, there's always corruption, which we could talk about if you wanted to, but uh, mostly around free speech was the biggest abuses of power that Kamuza Banda had. He had, uh, don't think Idi Amin, certainly no genocides, not Rwanda, nothing like that, but, uh, Poets, playwrights, um, reporters, free press was repressed, uh, those kind of things. And the church was actually instrumental in overthrowing, um, well, they didn't even really overthrow, they instituted multi-party democracy. Uh, and that was in 1994 and 95, 96, those three years. Um, and so since then there's been elections in Malawi and um, Kamuza Ben has since died. And, and so there's even been a Muslim president. Um, the current president um, is actually a Pentecostal professor. Um, and uh, so it's very, very African, very Malawian. Um, and, and again, a, a theme that you should pick up, even though there was this uprising, it was relatively limited and it, it actually affected positive political change, the, the transfer of power was very peaceful, there was no rebellion, there was no deaths. And the movement to multi-party democracy did involve large numbers of people demonstrating and there were certainly some casualties within that, but they were uh, very minimal comparatively speaking to other countries, we think of Kenya or something like that. And then uh, in 2019, um, the then president, Peter Mutarika, uh, claimed victory in an election 
and immediately the second place and third place um, politicians, candidates protested. And it's a complicated story, but it went to the Supreme Court or the, basically a Supreme Court and the judges overturned the election and called for a new election. And in the second election, uh, the second place, his name is Lazarus Chiquara, allied with the third place and, and a number of other smaller parties and clearly beat the sitting president, the incumbent president. And there, was, there were a few deaths. There, there was a fire bombing and there were a few other things, but we're talking less than 10 deaths. And so there was a relatively peaceful transfer of power uh, in this small, you know, imp largely impoverished economically um, country. So I guess that's a little bit of a theme about who Malawi is. They're generally um, peaceful, largely Presbyterian, um, but maybe not Presbyterians that we would recognize necessarily. Um, and uh, they, the church is very publicly engaged and very, um, there's something called the Public Action Committee, which is a sort of a, a lobby group or a, the, the Catholic bishops are part of it. And they, they, had, they send out letters that call on political leaders and, and millions of people will hear these and it will be significant. So uh, that's a little bit of the politics of, of Malawi. Um, and we, the Presbyterian Church of Canada have had, have had people in Malawi for a long time. And uh, I think that the most, the most dominant or the most prominent group would be um, Glenn and Linda Inglis were there off and on for 17 years. So they, they actually were there in the one party state under Kamuza Banda and then in through the transition into multi-party democracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, Glenn was uh, instrumental in, in being uh, helpful to the church there and in navigating that. But we've had lots of others. Um, and I mentioned, I think in my sermon, my colleague, Joel Sherbineau, mm -hmm. he's not too far from you in Ancaster. He's in Paris. 25% of his time is spent um, and is sponsored through Presbyterian sharing and um, coordinating a prison ministry that we do in Malawi. And uh, so I could talk about that if you'd like, but, um, you know, Ed Hoekstra had been there. They, there's been a lot of different people who have, have gone for various things. Well, I know um, one time during the AIDS epidemic, the, uh, our church was quite prominent in a hospital as it ended in the wiki. And, yeah, and then Gwenny. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, some of you would like this might be just repeating things that you already know, but our church has got multiple um, parts to it that do different things. Presbyterian World Service and Development, uh, really, um, their mandate is, is to do development work. So that's largely economic or some, some way of capacity building. Um, so they would do things in hospitals or they might do things with um, small farmers groups or micro loans or and they have partners all over the world who aren't necessarily Christian. Um, and the, the Presbyterian Church in Canada has benefited greatly through cooperating with the Canadian Food Grains Bank. And in turn, the Canadian Food Grains Bank has has um, used um, the government um, the, the Canadian government funding. And so we're part of all of that. Yeah. So a lot of our, a lot of our medical projects and our, a lot of, and one of the things that I tell people is, is that projects, projects are almost always PWS and D because PWS and D doesn't have any overseas staff. They only work with partners and they, um, that's anymore, certainly they don't do that. Um, and, and usually for a set amount of time. So we, we, during my time in Malawi, we wrapped up, PWSD wrapped up a, a, a mammoth 
maternal health program that we had been running in combination with Partners in Health in Haiti, Afghanistan, and Malawi, and in two different hospitals in Malawi. Um, and so I had some to do with that, but that's really another branch of the church. My branch of the church is the international ministries part, yeah. and we send people. That's what we do. And so um, I'm sent as a professor to teach, and uh, Joel was sent as a minister, and then now he's involved in the prison ministry. Uh, you know, I could go on and on. There are so many, so many of our missionaries, or what you would recognize as missionaries, were sent by international ministry. And it doesn't mean that they necessarily have to do ministry, uh, like wear a collar and be in, in, a, in a church. Um, but it, it often in the past, it has been that, but it could be that they were doctors. We had a, a couple, um, he's a medical doctor and um, Nepal is a very difficult place to get into, but we've had a partnership with a mission hospital in Nepal and um, we sent the Bauman family there for, for two years, which is the maximum that they could get a visa for. Um, so he's a doctor, but he's not really doing a project. He's, he's going to work at a hospital and he and his wife helped to organize hospitality ministry and doing other things around that. Um, so if you think PWS and D, you think projects, mm -hmm. likely large scale, not necessarily tied to a Christian organization. If you think international ministry, you think we send people, um, usually with a, a longstanding church partner that is there. Um, and it can be ministry, but it, it, it will always have some connection to the church, whatever it might be. Um, so I don't know why I got off on that, but uh, you're right, Anne, like we, it, the AIDS crisis brought about, um, at one point, Malawi had about 17, 18% of its population infected with HIV. Mm -hmm. One in five, almost one in five people had HIV AIDS. Um, so it was, it's just absolutely devastating. It's difficult for people, even, even people who have gone through COVID to understand what that meant for that society. Um, and so P PWS and D had done a lot of sort of educational programs and work with hospitals and medical professionals around antiretrovirals. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, um, we also sent people, Ed Hoekstra being one, but all, like the Inglises were there for part of that. Even Joel Sherbino, um, he was there 20 years ago, was still raging. Um, you know, we've done a lot of funerals. Um, like you think that you do a lot of funerals in in normal course of ministry. And, you know, we could be doing a minister in, in Malawi during the height of the AIDS crisis could be doing upwards of, of 10 funerals a week. Um, and, and funerals don't happen. Like, it's not like here where, you know, a person dies, they go to the, to the funeral home, they're embalmed and you can kind of wait for, for Aunt Ruth to come from Powell River to, to get here to do whatever. There's no embalming, there's no, there's nothing. So if a person dies, they the funeral is the next day and the burial is is that day. And so so everything stops because this person has died. Um, one of my predecessors at Samba Theological College, his name is Todd Statham. Uh, he he went before I was going, he he and I were chatting and he says, yeah, you really should make sure that there are classes because if there's a funeral of somebody that's prominent, the whole school will close and nobody will think to tell you because just everybody will know that that's what they're supposed to do. So there are a couple of times when he just showed up to school and wondered where all the students were and there were, <laughs> it was because they were all at a funeral. Um, and I guess that, I don't know, I could keep going. It does, but the idea of a funeral stopping everything is pretty indicative of how Malawians view the world in some ways. It's because, you know, they wouldn't try to schedule something that's convenient for their productivity. What they would do is they would, 
immediately prioritize the relationships that they have with each other. Mm -hmm. And so just because you want to get something done doesn't mean that they actually care about that. What they want to do is they want to attend to the relationship. That's more important than getting something done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not necessarily a bad way of viewing the world. Um, it certainly means that you don't get as much done as, as you might in a Canadian context, but it does mean that you are more embedded in a community and that your relationships are, I think, likely stronger um, for that. Um, it's a communitarian society. Mm -hmm. So they don't, they can't imagine themselves as individuals outside of the community. Whereas North Americans are an individualistic society. So we imagine ourselves as individuals who then choose to be in a community. Um, they, it's totally flipped in the other way. And so if you're a missionary, you just have to kind of roll with that because there's no, you're not going to change a whole culture and, and maybe you shouldn't, like it's not, there's nothing wrong with that um, unless they want to be more productive, but uh, so. They, yeah. have better, they have a better sense of what the Sabbath means yeah. in some ways. They do. Yeah, certainly that gets tested though, because um so people will, money becomes quite difficult. Uh, so, so in Canada, if you, if you have a friendship, right? Um, John and I are friends. Um, I won't know that John's really my friend until he gives me some money in Malawi. <laughs> Whereas in Canada, if he gave me money, I'm kind of like, are we really friends? Like, <laughs> is that what you're doing? And so, so, and there would be, like I talked about with Tom in my sermon, right? That there are moral obligations that people have, and you have a moral obligation to the community that you belong to, which is largely your family or your place of origin. Um, we might call it a tribe, they might even call it a tribe, but it's not really, um, it's more centered on your place and your language. Um, and so, so people who get money, you get a windfall or something, they immediately, the community knows because most things are public and most things are very communal. And so you are expected to contribute a, a more than you did before, because we know that you have money. So now why aren't you buying us all dinner? Why aren't you all doing, doing this, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine, so just imagine in Canada, you know, you, this is the strangest thing, right? Like, and for years, my dad traveled for business and wherever I was living, he'd come through and, and he'd, uh, he'd take me out for dinner and, you know, we'd have a steak and, and at the end of the night, he would pay, right? That, 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 cause I was younger and didn't have any money. Well, since then, you know, my brother makes oodles more cash than I do. You know, he was an executive at Nike for a while and, you know, he's, like he makes a lot of money, but even still, when we go out, my dad wants to pay, right? In Malawi, it would be my brother who would need to pay because we all know that he's got more money than my dad does. So he should be supporting my dad. He should be paying for my dad. Um, so it, uh, to bring it back to productivity and Sabbath, Many of my colleagues are the elite of their society. They're, they're educated, they have stable jobs even, but a stable job means that they get paid half the time, not all of the time. Like so I have colleagues, and most all of my colleagues don't get paid every month. Um, there's not enough money to pay them. Um, so 
but even still they're making more and they they can get more so the expectations that are placed on them are more so they don't actually get to sabbath very much because they're always in demand they're always being asked to do stuff they're always um whether it's visit somebody or buy something or preach something or do something but by and large the vast majority of people in malawi pretty good at sabbath they they take days off they're pretty good at grieving they'll just without without a bat of an eye take a day off and and go to a funeral but I don't know if that makes sense or if that's interesting at all, but it's very interesting. It's, it's a lot different here, especially even just in the time that I've been in ministry. It's, funerals seem to matter less and less. People just want to get it out of the way. And and uh, I, I know, I mean, it's a constant thing with some of the older funeral directors who are like, nobody stops for us anymore. But I know right. that in Malawi, that would, like like you say, the 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 idea that society would shut down is an idea that's so far gone for us. Um, but to, to see that other perspective. Um, yeah. And, you know, you have to, the, nobody has um, insurance and nobody kind of pays, like saves anything. So written into everybody's contract is your employer is in charge of funeral expenses up to a certain point for, so, you know, when I, I'm, I'm, I'm the agent, but you're the employer, the Presbyterian Church in Canada is the employer. So, you know, our contract with Tom, for instance, when, whenever his wife dies, you know, we're on the hook to pay for the vast majority of the funeral expenses for that. So, you know, we set aside some money um, at 50 Winford in order to be able to make sure that we, we can do that. But even, even if there's, you know, during COVID, some of the staff at, um, at ZTC died, um, two staff members died. And because I'm the, the white guy, the Azungu, um, my contribution to the funeral expenses is more than other people's, but we all have to contribute to, to that. Um, so there's kind of a corporate insurance around death and dying mm -hmm. and then so you're really invested like you're there like it's we live beside the, the house that that the presbyterian church owns is uh, adjacent to the biggest cemetery in malawi mm -hmm. so every day there'd be two or three funerals and big big semi trucks uh lorries like i guess they're not semis they're um big lorries big not not dump truck, but like one size down from a dump truck, like a big, anyways, filled with maybe 50, 60 women singing from the guild um, yeah. every day behind our house. And, and of course, it's like a dirt road and it's single and it was just chaos. And so they'd be singing for an hour, like just outside our, our gate or just well, our back fence or whatever. So um, yeah, so there's 60 people who just dropped everything to come and to sing for half a day. Um, uh, Blair, when you, when you were in Malawi, what did uh, your typical day look like? Yeah. Well, one of the great things about living in Malawi is that there are not very many typical things. Uh, so <laughs> I remember texting a friend or WhatsApping a friend saying, here's all of the things that I did today. Not one of these things is normal and not one of these things could I kind of imagine like before getting here. But um, during a semester time, on, um, I had classes on Mondays and Wednesdays um, in Zamba. So Blantyre is about an hour away from, from Zamba. So I would be in Zamba by, seven, well, at the latest, 7.30. Um, there's only 11% of the country has electricity or has access to electricity. 
So things really run by the sun and it's close enough to the equator that there's not a lot of deviation during the year about what time the sun sets and rises. So in general, people will get up five-ish, 4.30-ish, five-ish. Um, and so our kids had to be at school by seven. Um, and so, you know, I'd be, I'd be leaving the house, the kids would be up. Um, we had chickens, turkeys, guinea fowl, quail. My son raised birds, so he would off, be outside doing his chores, um, cleaning up his birds and feeding his birds and doing whatever bird thing he had to do. Uh, so I'd drive to, to Zamba. I would teach about three hours of class. Um, and then normally, I would try to take somebody to lunch and have a meeting at lunch. And there was, there was one fast food place. It was a, it's a South African burger chain it's called Steers, pretty original name. Not, and on Wednesdays, it's Wacky Wednesdays. And so you get, it's kind of two for one. So my colleagues always like to, have meetings on wacky Wednesdays. Um, and then the other time there was this sort of decrepit colonial golf and country club because Zamba used to be the capital of the country. And so the British, wherever the British went, they built tennis courts and golf clubs. And so there was this golf club, but it was not like a golf club that you would recognize. There were some that you could recognize, but they had, there was a little restaurant there that had food that was more expensive than, you know, kind of street food that, that Azungu white people could eat. Um, yeah, so I, we'd have faculty meetings or I'd have other meetings in the afternoons and then try to get back. You always try to get back before dark um, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, the vast majority of the population are walking like, like when we first came back, um, my kids were shocked. They're like, look at the side of these roads. They're so big. You could fit so many people on these things. And, and we're like, yeah, but nobody's allowed to walk along the 401 or nobody's allowed to like, they were just shocked. They couldn't, they had forgotten that people don't walk everywhere. Yeah. And so if you have that many black bodies at night, beside a road and there's no shoulder, you know, it's not safe for them and it's not safe for you. And then you have a lot of unlicensed drivers, a lot of um, unlicensed vehicles, um, unmaintained vehicles. So it becomes more dangerous at night. So try to get home by dinner. Um, and we'd have, we have had a cook and he'd have dinner and then, um, Kids would do homework and go to bed nine-ish. That's kind of, and then on the other days I would work in the office. There was a home office and, you know, reading or writing or getting ready to teach or um, doing what other things. Some Saturdays I had to teach with team, which didn't really talk about too much. I don't think in the sermon, but Theological education by extension Malawi. So we, we do lay leaders training. Um, so, um, so yeah, my day was, yeah. And also though you have, everything just takes longer. Like, you know, your internet service, like you think you, you think the bell's a pain in the neck here. Well, like, like any anything is just to get your visa. It takes days, like of standing in line and and to to make sure that you've bribed the right person and you've got the right cash and you've signed the right form and um you know to get your car insured and to you know, we had a mechanic and the mechanic he would come to the house like he'd drive up in his car and he come inside the gate and he'd work on your car right 
in your driveway so that you could see that he wasn't stealing parts and that he was doing what he was supposed to do. But you got to be around to make sure that he's not stealing parts and like he's doing all these things. And, um, so everything just kind of takes longer um, to do. Um, we had to host people, um, which we enjoyed doing. Um, for a while, we had a retired couple. We had a lot. We have a there's a guest house that's um, part of the property. It's not a very big property, but there's a guest house that's there. It's very nice, and so we often had guests, but also um, we hosted guests for longer periods of time, visiting ministers, uh, visiting missionaries. Um, uh, an Anglican priest we had for, and his wife were there for three months. Um, a former a PCUSA, a Presbyterian Church of the United States of America, um, professor and his wife stayed there for five months. A Scottish academic who continues to be my colleague at Zamba, when he first arrived, his house wasn't ready in Zamba, so he stayed with us. So, you know, we had I was kind of the boss. That's what the staff called me. So there are always boss things to do. <laughs> there's a, yeah, I think there's a solar power system at the house. Um, so, you know, I had to organize buying that, getting that, installing that, tweaking that, reinstalling, doing like, you know, no end of things to do with making sure that we have electricity and hot water and those kind of things. My day did not involve any cooking because uh, <laughs> that was Matthew's job and very little cleaning because that was Ines's job and didn't mow the lawn once. They actually don't mow the lawn very much because the grass isn't the same kind of grass that we've got. It's more, um, I don't even know what, what it's called, but it's it's more like a vine hmm. um, that kind of goes in the little sprigs. It, it's not not like ours, where like you could pull up a, a single piece. If you pulled it up, then a whole mat of grass was going to kind of come up. But so he had a machete thing, like a golf club. I actually joke that I should create one, like I could do with my golf swing. But, Thanks, Blair. Thanks for that. I wonder if uh, Blair, you could say a little bit about what uh, being Presbyterian looks like in Malawi, because I, I I know it's quite a bit different from from here in Canada. Yeah, it's different, and sometimes it's the same. Um, Malawi, like many places, has kind of a colonial hangover that they're still trying to get over or not. Um, so ministers wear collars again talk about the hierarchical nature of society um, where in North America, you might want to try to hide that you're a minister. In Malawi, you always want to advertise that you're a minister because you get preferential treatment because you're higher on the hierarchy. Um, and me with a collar, I'm white. So they think I have money automatically. Um, and I'm wearing a collar. And then as soon as they find out that I'm a professor, like I'm three levels up uh, <laughs> on most, which has the disadvantage of being that um, whenever I would walk into a church, like if I walked into your church in Ancaster, unannounced or just kind of came for a visit, I'd be the only white person, first of all. Um, and so they would know automatically that I don't belong there or that I'm a guest. Um, and then very quickly, all the ministers that knew who I was, because I had been introduced, they would realize who I was. And so I would be expected to go up and preach because almost always I would have more seniority over the minister that was there. So even though it's like John's pulpit in Canada, uh, in a hierarchical society, because I have a PhD and I teach at one of our colleges, I would be ranked higher than John. And so then it would be embarrassing to them to not have me 
preach. So he would automatically, no matter what he had been doing, like he would just defer and then I would have to preach. So it's a pain in two ways, right? Because you make the minister, you know, junk their sermon, not that they likely prepared tons for it, but and then you always have to have a sermon ready to go because wherever you go, you're almost always the highest ranking person. So, um, so yeah, worship. So they have, so they wear collars. Um, I've been collecting vestments. Um, Bob Spencer, some of you might know, uh, was the founding director at Creef. He yeah. died recently. Uh, he had a lot of, of vestments. And so I'm bringing those to Malawi to give to my Malawian colleagues because they love to have bright vestments and to dress up and to, um, to be attired liturgically appropriate. Although they don't really, like they don't follow any kind of, like Christmas just arrives. Like there's no sort of lead up to it or anything. It's just like, oh, next week it's Christmas. So we're going to have a concert. Okay, done. Like, it's not like they've, like they've gone through Advent and done all that sort of stuff, then none of that. It's just, um, which I, I'm kind of a low church guy. So I'm like, that's perfectly fine by me. But I'm sure that some of my liturgically oriented people who are like, well, we can only wear green at these times of year and red at this time of year. And this is a white Sunday. I'm like, Malawi, you just wear your brightest and your best all the time. And so... <laughs> Um, yeah, and so to give credit, uh, Linda Ashfield and a number of other women who have recently retired from ministry are also have also donated their vestments and are sending that. And I see that hand. Yes, I had. I was blessed in my ministry. I have uh, two preaching gowns that I don't need. Like I was given. I have three, and I would mm -hmm. like to, to know how I could get them to you because you just bring uh, it to Creef. Just bring it to Creef. Okay, if that's you, not if a you can. Yeah, if you can ever get it to Creef, because. So when we first came back, that's where we lived. And Christine, the O'Brien family and the Bertrand family are close friends. So almost always, and my parents live in Elmira mm -hmm. and they're, they're getting older. And so whenever I come to Southern Ontario, which is about once a month, um, I always swing by Creef to, to see Christine. And my son worked at Creef this past summer and stuff. So um, people know it and they've got lots of space. So you can just- I can drop those off then, thank you. Yeah, but, so books or uh, books and um, investments and callers. Emma Duncan, who's in Burlington, she's going to donate. She's got some extra clerical shirts. Um, so Presbyterianism, though, um, yeah. So you're going to have a lot more. Um, well, I could just end the sentence that you're going to have a lot more. Like it's just going to go for a lot longer. Um, there's nothing that's scripted or written down, except when you come to communion. And then they're using a liturgy usually written in the early 1900s from the Scottish Book of Prayer, uh, which I'm sure that most Malawians don't understand at all, because like I'm, I'm leading this and I'm barely understanding it. It's not, it does not have this, it's not the same nice cadence as the Book of Common Prayer or something like that. It's just, it's just, oh my word, lots of these and thous and lots and not, no. Um, but by and large, everything is done just off the top of your head. So there's no, most of the time sermons aren't written down. Um, they, they can go 40 minutes to an hour. Um, there's usually a large number of choirs. So um, you get at least two choirs per service. Um, mm. And they would be doing, I don't know, three or four pieces each. Um, um, all a cappella, because most churches don't have any kind of musical instrumentation. Um, if it's a big church, so they're like in Blantyre, there's something called the big five, there'd be five big churches. Um, they all have sound systems, which are horrible. They, they echo funny because it's just a concrete building and with tile floor, I hate them. But um, yeah, 
everything in Malawi seems to go to 11 as soon as they can go like get it amplified. <laughs> like there's a special knob for Malawian amplifiers. It goes to 11. Um, so it's loud and very enthusiastic. People love to wear the same, it's like a uniform. They wear the same, whatever your choir uniform is and it'll be brightly colored or whatever. Um, they have choir competitions. It's a little bit like, I don't know if you guys are basketball fans, but the NCAA has their, their big tournament, the March Madness tournament, you know, where you start with 64 teams and you work up in, on a bracket. So just imagine that, except for with choirs, that's what they do. Um, so you have to win at your presbytery level and then you win at a regional level and then you finally get to go to the synod level. Um, and there's two days of choir competition and um, it's a big deal, big, big deal. Um, so yeah, and they have, they like they have more services. So they would have, a, they'll have cottage meetings which are like house church meetings. Um, a congregation, <laughs> like, Canadians are always amazed when I say this. You don't really have a congregation under a hundred, so uh, any any group of people under a hundred would be a prayer house, and so they get together every Sunday. So a, a congregation might have um, one main service, but it might have ten prayer houses that are going on uh, in different parts of the area. Um, they don't really do two point charges. They do like a mother church with lots of prayer houses. Um, and uh, like a big church, a couple thousand people at worship. Um, I've been in villages where, you know, there's been 150 people. Um, so in a village, it'll be a tin roof, a steel roof, uh, open open, uh, no ceiling, like open rafters, brick building. Malawi only has three things, dirt, sun, and people. And so they bake bricks, that's what they do. And so the seating will be bricks, the, like it'll, there'll be rows of bricks, seating benches in a village, not in a, in a city church. So it'll be like those plastic um, deck chairs, not the Adirondack kind, but the stacking kind that you might have. You know, on guest come, you will, you will have a couple of extra chairs. That's what they that's what they would use. Um, yeah, my service might go for three or four hours. The, but you're not expected to show up. Well, unless you're me or like the minister, you have to be there the whole time. But people wander in and out. One minister once said. Oh, don't worry, Abusa. Abusa means minister. Don't worry, Abusa. Take as much time as you want. We don't hurry God here. And so... Um, <laughs> That's a way to phrase it. <laughs> yeah, so they just kind of... My kids, my kids would get in the habit of... They didn't always go to church. I, I, they, they became a spectacle because, you know, if we went to a village, we might be the only white people these people have seen. And anyways, it's not... So it wasn't a particularly worshipful experience always for my kids. So they didn't always come. But if they did come, um, they would time the prayers. And so they would give an award at the end for the longest prayer. And so, you know, they, the preacher might, or the, the prayer might pray for 25 minutes, 30 minutes. So they do do some... Um, they do exorcisms, but not usually on Sunday morning. Almost never on Sunday morning. Um, but it's kind of a deliverance ministry, deliverance and healing ministry. So they might have a revival for a week and have services every night. And that, that might happen at one of those. But it could happen on the side or like at another time. Most Presbyterians in Canada wouldn't wouldn't think that that's a regular part of your worship life. 
Um, yeah, and as I said, they don't really follow a liturgy. So the liturgical calendar doesn't really mean too much. Easter and Christmas, like they celebrate that at the same time as everybody else, but it's not a, it is certainly not part of, well, the liturgical renewal movement hasn't made it to Malawi yet. So <laughs> yes, John. Um, uh, I'm involved in a lot of music, have always been in my life. And uh, that was just a plus for me when I became a minister. But uh, what about the hymnology there? Is that, if not having any instruments, uh, how does that come off? And do they use lay readers in a service? Yeah, uh, so two questions. They, there is a Malawian hymn book that they don't, certainly a church would never own their own set. Like you're expected to bring your own hymn book and your own Bible. Um, and so that's again a mark of of hierarchy. So most of the most of the songs they have memorized, and so they're quite lively. But they will sing things like "Crown Him with Many Crowns." They they know the words to something like that. Um, so some classic sort of hymns they would certainly know and do. Um, Christmas carols they would certainly do. Um, but they have a lot of music that's in excuse me in the vernacular mm -hmm. so in chichewa in the south chibuka in the south, in the north and so you they learn those those songs and some you know literacy rate is not super high comparatively speaking so nobody reads music they all but they but at the same time you know one of my colleagues once confessed, she said, you know, you, you a Zungu, you must have a radio in your head. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? She goes, because whenever I see you dancing, you're not dancing to the same tune that I hear. <laughs> and so, so they seem to wow. do quite well. That they're actually, Ian Ross McDonald, who's the general secretary of the Presbyterian Church in Canada, uh, came with Daniel Cho when, when, when Cho was the moderator. And so I hosted him and took him around. And, and I pitched a, a mission trip um, to Ian. And he had, before COVID, it was actually moving forward. I proposed bringing about 10 choir directors or music people from Canada over for two weeks, the week leading up to the choir competition and then a week after, and to partner these choir directors from Canada with a choir director in Malawi in the lead up to the competition to be there for the competition and then to debrief the competition and to figure out in what ways could, could that kind of music be brought back in ways that has integrity to what we do. Um, because, because I think that there's a lot of skill involved. I'm not particularly musical. My one of my choir directors, when I left, said, or music directors, whatever, at the church I was serving, said, one of the great things about Blair is he knows that his musical ability ends after he's pressed play. So, it's uh, it's I I don't I couldn't do it, but I think that there's likely something that music directors could learn from having almost no resources, but the voices of, of these enthusiastic people. Yeah, yeah. And um, now saying that there are some people who really do love sort of classic music. And so there are a few places that have an organ, very few, maybe one or two mm -hmm. in the country. And so they, uh, but they, uh, so there are some, but they, they'd be, the big churches, big high churches. Yeah. Uh, you asked me another question. What was the other question? It was about music and. What was your other questions? Your lay readers. Oh, oh lay yeah, readers. lay readers. Oh yeah, yeah. So lay they readers. have. Yeah, it's just a strange thing, or it was it was strange for me. Uh, there's always a meeting in the vestry with all of the elders um, right before worship, 
And so, you know, you, all, you have to get introduced to everybody and shake everybody's hand and pray and everything. But they, they also, they have an order of service. It never changes. It's always the same for that church. And, and so they assign people to do all of the different things right there. So like this 25 minute prayer gets assigned two seconds before worship starts. Like, it's not like this person has been working on this or whatever. Just <laughs> as an elder, you're expected to be able to lead worship in. And, and I've actually seen it where, so they'll have multiple services and, and I would often only just go to one service. And so at the end of one service, they would, they would hold sort of, like I have to pray in the vestry after the service and that the new group moving into the next service would also be present. And they would assign the sermon to one of the elders and just say, okay, you're preaching this week. And he'd look at the text and go, okay. And not once did anybody kind of like protest or whatever. So this, there's always a master of ceremonies and sometimes it's the minister, but usually it's not, usually it's an, an elder and they, they do all the welcoming and announcements and calling people up and recognizing and and sometimes ministers are a little bit um, controllish and so they'll pull on the guy's pants and say Strip it better, and tell him what to do but they usually it's just it's up to this elder to run the show um, thank you all right. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for taking this time with us, Blair. It's been yeah, uh, no problem. Here you. Um, and, and what, actually, one 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 last thought. Um, I remember when you were at Creve, you mentioned one one movie that that to to give people a sense of what Malawi's like. Um, you mentioned that was it the boy who harnessed the wind. Yeah. So if you haven't watched that, it's I'm not sure if it's still on Netflix, but uh, it is a, a story that was written by a Malawian. Actually, my daughter's met the guy that that wrote the book and experienced it. It's a kind of autobiography about um, his own experiences. And he was actually in farther north, but yeah. Yeah, it's very Malawian. Um, the, some of the, so if you've not been to Malawi, you won't know, but some of the accents aren't particularly authentic, but uh, the, the general gist and everything is all very authentic and very, uh, they, they have to kind of hide some of the political. At one time, there's a kind of a bad politics person. And so they've had to kind of obscure who that is because they don't want to get in trouble. But yeah, it's all very realistic. Mm -hmm. And in that, you'll see, um, and it may be disorienting, and I don't think in a bad way, but they'll, they have these sort of... Um, there are figures in with masks and they're, they represent the spirits. So you can see that. Um, so after you see that, if you have questions, you just call me and we can figure out how the spirits. Well, I, I double checked. It is still on Netflix and I, I actually watched it after, uh, after we were at Creef and I, I found it really interesting. It's uh, so, and if you're looking, looking for a good window into Malawi, it's, uh, it's still there. Yeah, and so it was his experiences were early in the multi-party democracy. And so we haven't talked about economic policy or environment or anything in Malawi, but um, things have not gotten better. Let's just say that. Um, and so, um, and, and poverty changes, I think. The character of poverty changes over time. Um, and... The people in Malawi are, are you know, kind of a worse situation than they were previously. Um, maybe not as poor in some ways, but in other ways, the poverty is, it's crueler and a little bit more debasing, I think. So, but he, he's dealing with poverty, so it's worth, worth watching. All right. Well, thank you again so much uh, for for coming and uh, sending us a message this morning and, uh, and spending this time with us. Yeah, great. Very Thanks. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank All you. right. Thanks, folks. That's great.